Stephen Gerald James Wright was born on April the 24th, 1958, in Erpingham, Norfolk. He was the second child of four, an elder brother and two younger sisters. His dad was a military policeman and his mother was a veterinary nurse. Sometime in the 1960s, his mother left, leaving eight-year-old Wright with his dad. They divorced in 1977 and both remarried. Eventually, his dad and his new partner went on to have more children. After leaving school in 1974 at the age of 16, Wright joined the Merchant Navy and began working on commercial ships, mostly, I believe, ferries, that sailed from Felixstowe in Norfolk. In 1978, at the age of 21, he met his future wife, Angela O'Donovan, in Milford Haven, a town in Pembrokeshire, Wales. The couple had a son, but by 1987 they had separated, eventually divorcing. His second marriage in 1987, and while working as a pub landlord in Norwich, lasted a year before they split up in 1988. Apparently there was quite a lot of DV from Wright towards his second wife Diane. Neighbours bore witness to some of his behaviour and had to step in to help on occasions when he would threaten her with strangulation. While working as a manager for a public house in South London, he met his next partner in 1989 and they had a child in 1992. This relationship apparently ended in 1993. But the managerial job at the pub ended when he began drinking and gambling heavily. Apparently he became very depressed when his gambling led him to declare bankruptcy. It's said that he attempted to unalive himself twice, the last attempt being in 2000. When he was arrested in 2001 for theft of around £80, his DNA was placed into the national database. This would prove crucial to his arrest for the Suffolk murders. He moved to Ipswich in 2004 with the new woman in his life, who he had met in Felixstowe. Wright had, apparently, let it be known that he had an obsession with street workers. He didn't hide the fact that he enjoyed being with working girls and had done so from the 1980s. He had often frequented brothels. Over the years, Wright had a number of different jobs. A dockyard worker, a barman, a steward on the QE2, a lorry driver and lastly, before his arrest, a forklift truck driver. On December the 2nd, 2006, a member of the public was out walking at Belstead Brook at Thorpe's Hill near Hindhulsham, when to their horror they saw a body in the water. The body was identified as 25-year-old Gemma Adams. Gemma had been living in Ipswich with her boyfriend. He became concerned when she didn't return his texts or calls when she disappeared on the 15th of November 2006. Her body was naked, but she hadn't been essayed. Gemma was a popular, happy girl who enjoyed horse riding and the piano. She apparently came from a good affluent family, but as a teenager had started taking recreational drugs that led to an addiction to harder drugs like H. She had had a good job with an insurance company, but her addiction problems led her to losing her job and she turned to the streets to make money to feed her addiction. On December the 8th, the body of 19-year-old Tanya Nicol, who had been missing since October the 30th, 2006, was discovered in water at Copdock Mill near Ipswich. Tanya was the first to be reported as missing. Her family became concerned when she failed to return home that night, and her mother reported her daughter as missing to the police. She was the second to be found. She also hadn't been essayed. It was thought her body had been in the water for at least five weeks, but it couldn't be fully established how she died. Tanya also worked the streets to fund her drug addiction and had been friends with Gemma Adams. 
her devastated father made an appeal to the public to help find his daughter's killer. He stated, unfortunately, drugs took her away into her own secret world that we were not aware of. On December the 10th, in a woodland area close to the A14 road near Acton, a member of the public driving past spotted 24-year-old Anna Lee Alderton's naked body. Anna Lee was three months pregnant when she disappeared on the 3rd of November. She was last seen on the 1753 train from Harwich to Manningtree. She got off the train at 8.15 before catching another train to Ipswich. She had been asphyxiated and apparently posed in the cruciform position. Her drug addiction had apparently began after her dad died from lung cancer in 1998. The police first became concerned when Tanya Nicol disappeared in October. It became more worrisome when they realised they had another young woman missing when Gemma Adams was also reported as missing. Two women who worked the streets and frequented the same area had vanished. The search for the missing women was stepped up. A leaflet campaign started with hundreds handed out. Periodical road checks carried out. Hundreds of people were interviewed, but nothing came of it. On the 10th of December, a press conference was held by detectives from the Suffolk Constabulary, issuing a warning to all women in Ipswich not to work on the streets. The red light district had a heavy police presence at the time. They began to lose hope and search parties were sent out, scouring the countryside for their bodies. Weeks later, the first body was discovered. It was Gemma Adams, and just six days later, Tanya Nicole was found. The Suffolk police were overwhelmed. More women were being reported as missing. They received offers of help with the investigation, codenamed Operation Sumac, from police forces across the country in their hope for the killers or killer of the young women. Due to the scale of the investigation, a senior investigator with the Met Police, Commander Dave Johnston, was drafted in from Scotland Yard in an advisory capacity. The day-to-day -day investigation was conducted by Detective Chief Superintendent Stuart Gull. Days later, Annalee Alderton's body was discovered. This time, Annalee's body had been found on dry land, making it easier to find forensic evidence, as the first two bodies, that of Tanya and Gemma, had been found in water, making it difficult to determine how they had died. Any trace evidence from the cold water had been washed away. As the weather changed, the rain presented a huge problem, so tents were erected quickly to preserve the scene. The evidence will be washed away unless we got the tent over the body as soon as possible. By this time, the Suffolk police realised they had a major problem. It had all the hallmarks of a serial killer. On the 12th of December, Suffolk police announced to the public that two more female bodies had been found. One by a member of the public and the other found by police helicopter while investigating the first body found. They confirmed that one of the women was found close to where Annalie's body had been found in Nacton. The police now had five bodies in 10 days. 24-year-old Paula Clonell, who had disappeared on the 10th of December, had last been seen in Ipswich. She lived in Ipswich and was a mother to three children, although they didn't live with her. She also worked the streets. Although she was said to be wary about going out because of the murders, she stated she needed the money. Paula had also been brought up as a child in care, and it's been said that this is where her drug problem started. A post-mortem showed she had been strangled, along with an overdose of drugs. 29-year-old Annette Nichols, a mother of one, also from Ipswich, had disappeared on the 8th of December in the early 2000s. She was just about to finish a beautician's course, 
but her addiction led to her working the streets to fund her abbot. She disappeared on the 5th of December and her body was found near a place called Levington. She was also naked, but not essayed. She was also posed in the cruciform position. Why Wright chose to pose the bodies this way isn't known. The local and national media were all over the story, wanting to talk to anyone who had a story to tell. The story spread, the world media descending on Ipswich, broadcasting the awful news of more women being found around the world. After the public press conference on the 12th of December, the police received a record number of phone calls from the public and did 10,000 interviews, but they couldn't find a witness who'd seen anything that maybe looked like someone getting rid of a weapon or clothes. One name came up on more than one occasion, Tom Stevens. He had spoken openly to the media about how easy he could have done the crime. He was taken in for questioning and a thorough forensic search was carried out on him and his home. Due to the amazing work from Ray Palmer, a lead forensic scientist and one of the hundred experts used in the investigation, he and his team found DNA on the bodies. The DNA didn't match that of the suspect Tom Stevens, so he was released without charge. The killer was still out there. Feeding the DNA into the database, a match was found, that of Stephen Wright, his DNA being in the database from his last conviction for theft. His DNA was found on three of the bodies. Stephen Wright lived in the area the women had disappeared from. Although he had only moved there with his partner a few weeks before, the first woman went missing. He had been known to curb crawl and had been stopped by police on a couple of occasions. He was also in the system from one of the road checks. On the nights the girls went missing, his partner Pam had been working nights. And on the 19th of December at around 5am, the police arrested Wright at his home in Ipswich for the murders of all five women. Stephen Wright was not going to confess. So hours of questioning was fruitless. Go missing with your DNA and the one before with your DNA. Both on their naked bodies. How can that be? No comment. The investigation continued. They needed to combat the fact that he used the working girls so of course his DNA would be on them. They needed additional evidence. A specialist was brought in to look through CCTV camera footage from the red light area. Inspector Steve Griss used an automatic car number plate reader to identify Wright's Ford Mondeo car. After hundreds of hours of footage, they finally discover footage showing Wright was in the red light area at the key times when each of the five women had disappeared. Specifically, they found footage of Tanya Nicole getting into Wright's car on the night she disappeared. More forensics showed fibers from his clothes, car and home on all five of the girls. After one of the largest and most intense investigations, Wright was finally caught by the police. On the 14th of January 2008, Wright went on trial. He still maintained his innocence and pled not guilty. He gave the same answer to each question asked. It would seem so, yes. DNA found on the girls that were found on dry land showed their DNA on his gloves Blood from Paula Clinell and Annette Nichols was found on his reflective jacket and fibres from his home was found on four of the five bodies. He still maintained he hadn't killed the girls. The jury went out to deliberate and after six hours they returned with a guilty verdict. 
the serial killer who had instilled fear into the people of Ipswich and who the media had nicknamed the Suffolk Strangler was sentenced to life imprisonment with the judge, Mr Justice Gross, recommending he never be released. Mr Justice Gross also said Wright had targeted the vulnerable women. He said drugs and prostitution meant that they were at risk but neither drugs nor prostitution killed them. You did. Questions were starting to be asked. At the age of 48, it was unusual for a serial killer to start killing that late in life. So could there be others? There are unsolved murders that could possibly be linked to right and the police are still to this day investigating. 